We've all been there, struggling to remember your script, fumbling through your video because you didn't want to script it and then forgot it, ignoring chat for a little too long, or getting self-conscious about only showing your forehead to those you're video conferencing with. The camera lens is often your harshest critic, the most intimidating thing you'll ever face. Well, no more! The ultimate innovation in teleprompters is here. Elgato Prompter puts the pro in teleprompter. Camera goes on one side, screen on the other, beam splitting glass, not a mirror, goes in the middle, and you've got a teleprompter. It's like having a monitor on your camera that you can see through, but with software to give you tons of prompting options. It's the teleprompter that's always got your back. Or rather, your face. Yes, you should be using a teleprompter, even if you aren't scripting all your videos, or you're not even making videos at all. It can be super useful for looking and feeling your best on camera but the market for them has historically not been fun to navigate. Plus, using a teleprompter elegantly is not easy. I still struggle with it sometimes. Hopefully, in this video, we can briefly review the Ogato prompter in all of its glory and help guide you on the best practices for both natural and professional presentation and how to, you know, get up to speed with using it properly without the, the awkwardness of, what's the script say? H hello? Uh, it's got a learning curve. Teleprompters are used in TV shows, broadcasts, YouTube videos, live show production, and meeting scenarios to allow you to kind of do all sorts of things, though often it's just to see a live reaction or read from a script like I'm doing now. That's the primary goal, it's just reading from a script while still looking at the camera. The camera sits on one side of the glass and shoots through it to see your subject, probably you, while the beam splitter glass uh, allows whatever is on the screen itself to be reflected onto one side of it, but not really, you know, shined through to the other side where the lens is. As long as most of the screen is just showing black, there's usually no reflections or glare shown in camera, you know, as long as it's set up correctly, which can be a little tricky, but we'll cover. Ogato just released their new teleprompter for streamers and creators, the Ogato Prompter, and while it seems like it comes at a high price tag at 289 ish dollars, for the features it offers, it's honestly pretty cheap. Remember, if there are cheaper options available, cool, go with them. If they if, if they meet your needs, go for the cheaper option. You're not going to convince the product to be cheaper. When recording videos, hosting live streams or meetings, it can be tough to feel comfortable, act natural, and keep a professional presentation without fumbling over everything. What's the script? I got to make sure everything's set up. Blah, blah, blah. With... I did it there. <laughs> while a teleprompter while a teleprompter certainly isn't something I'd put on the list for a newcomer streamer or creator, nevertheless one that's meant to be a high-end solution, it's definitely something people who have been doing this a long time or at least a while could benefit from. But adding more jank and fumbling to your setup would only make it worse. That's why while you can absolutely DIY your own prompter if you source the right glass and everything, precariously balance a phone on top of your lens or Set a monitor next to your camera as an alternative, as everyone wanted to remind me on Twitter this past week. If you value your time, efforts, and reducing friction, you don't want to keep dealing with that kind of setup. You just don't. I've done it. I've done it over and over. I'm done doing it. You want something that's going to make your life easier instead, much like how hotkeys and devices like Elgato Stream Deck that I'm using here to pause and resume my script helps avoid fumbling with scene switching and alt tabbing. A teleprompter aims to keep your focus on your audience rather than on juggling windows and paper scripts and so on. The slightly off the lens options are distracting not only to your audience as you're plainly just kind of looking off screen to read your script and it's, eh. while some people don't mind it, it can be really grating for some people, but to you as a creator as it's distracting trying to look back and forth and in doing so, you're far more likely to lose all sense of pacing or emotion from your script. I've done this, again, many times. A lot of my videos are a little more monotone early on because I am so focused on it, and sometimes I still struggle with that. Or it can make you lose track of your thoughts in a video call. This is something I get overstimulated by and struggle with a lot, trying to juggle listening to other people, especially if there's echo or something in the room, remembering what you want to say and trying to look back from like a screen to the camera and back, like whatever. It's just a lot, especially for us neurodivergent folk. So again, you can do that. And Give it a go before spending money on anything. It's just not what a lot of us want to deal with. A prompter is admittedly less important for stream chat. It can give you a more personable way to engage by reading and responding to chat rather than, you know, while you're looking at the camera rather than the 
I don't care. Here's a 45 degree angle of my head of my forehead while I'm gaming and reading the chat. I'm going to be slouched back. You know, the, 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 the dude bro setup, but you don't need it here. But even as someone with a bunch of monitors at most of their streaming setups, <laughs> it's really annoying trying to juggle a chat window with your other windows because you got OBS, you've got whatever your content you're streaming. You probably got some web pages you're bringing up while you're streaming to reference or talk about or that people want to link you. You've got your game if you're gaming on the same. There's just a lot. And as convenient as the chat doc solutions in OBS are, I usually have other stuff pulled up in front of OBS when I'm doing most of my streams. And my current gaming streaming setup that I'm here at right now only has the one preview monitor because this is a big CRT. <laughs> I don't have a way of doing the other stuff. Having chat on its own dedicated screen is already a bonus. A lot of streamers have been investing in these little Chinesium Amazon monitors just for that, just to have it in a more easy to access place. But this gives you the benefit of having it on your camera lens, which is great for reading and responding in real time, but not so great if you want to do a bunch of scrolling back to, you know, look at previous chat messages. That gets kind of fumbly. Twitch chat is primarily supported by default on the chat module for Camera Hub for now, but you can always pop out your chat in dark, dark mode from any streaming service. Use Control Plus to make the text bigger and then put it on the prompter in full screen or side by side with your event list. An annoying workaround, but still 100% doable and serviceable and how most people usually do it, especially since there's a never ending list of new streaming services that probably need to be, you know, supported over time. I have a video linked below where I show you a way you can get an always active link to your most recent YouTube live chat. If you want, you can also just pop out the OBS docs for that specifically too, and then put them on the prompter. That's the beauty of it working as a display. You put whatever you want on it. Are you tired of being a streaming noob? Do you want to learn how to stream like a pro? Then you need the Definitive Guide to OBS. The ultimate masterclass for OBS Studio, the Definitive Guide to OBS will teach you everything you need to know to become a streaming and recording expert in no time at all. Even if your computer is a potato. To celebrate the relaunch of my Definitive Guide to OBS on a new amazing platform, I'm offering a special 50% discount. Use coupon code RELAUNCH at checkout. A big part of seeming like yourself on camera is the intimidation that some feel when they're staring at the camera lens. It's inhuman, inanimate, and yet seemingly very judgmental. So many people, including professional actors and hosts, struggle to stare right into the lens to record video on their own if they're not part of a production. Having a preview monitor of yourself, the person you're speaking to, or someone who might be assisting or supervising your shoot gives you that human connection and eye contact that can help you feel you know, more comfortable. It can help you feel more at home. Like you're talking to a person and not a robot. You're either seeing yourself or you don't have to worry about how you look in the first place or you're seeing someone else and you're just talking to them like you would in real life. This is doable by either mirroring your webcam source or your video call feed source right out to an OBS projector preview and send that to the new monitor created by the prompter. It creates a virtual display on your computer so you can just mirror out the OBS projector preview like you normally would. The eye contact helps you seem more human and connectable, but it can also help any guests or collaborators feel more comfortable like they're actually talking to you too, which can help a lot. Another point of coordination that is difficult when making videos or streams is figuring out your overhead angles and figuring out where your hands go there. Unboxings, card videos, or just showing projects, mini paintings. I always struggle to keep my hands in just the right spot with overhead cams, but especially when I'm trying to not just show the face cam, you know, the top of my head, you know, leaning over when I'm trying to have the face up as well. You can use OBS projector preview on your overhead camera scene or your split view scene to easily see your overhead view while you're still looking at the camera. So you, so you can manage all that. Very useful for split view shots or just keeping your energy up. Sometimes when you're looking down at something, it's easy to kind of let your, we, we tend to mumble and lower our energy when we're concentrating, but staying upright and still looking at the lens helps us present more professionally. Oh, we're doing something with our hands down here. As a bonus tip, if you want to see yourself and your script, someone wanted the ability to chroma key themselves via a second input. Simply make a scene with that in OBS, where you're chroma keyed out over top your chat or script, or just side by side with it, and then set the OBS projector preview for that scene to output to the prompter. Boom. If you're using projector previews for other things, we may need to talk about some sort of multi-projector output plugin for OBS or something. All of these ideas do have the opportunity to make your presentation worse in some ways, but don't worry, I won't let you struggle too much. A whole chunk of this video is dedicated to taming the learning curve. 
we've got this. You can also put up your event list from Stream Elements or Streamlabs up there so you can monitor your recent subs and tips, you know, in between matches or something like that. You could add your chat as an OBS scene and your alerts over top and then preview that out to the prompter so you see alerts as they happen. You could set up the elements side by side in the scene so you could see a bunch of stuff at once. The screen's pretty big. There are a lot of possibilities. Lastly, of course, you could use the prompter for video scripting. Memorizing lengthy video scripts is rough. And for someone like me, even remembering beyond a sentence or two without days of preparation is a struggle. Scripting videos definitely requires a bit of a workflow shift, but it can drastically improve the quality of your videos, but also the, the speed at which you produce them by way of giving you, you know, more accurate takes in your recording, not having so much filling or filler or fluffing about as that you need to trim down later. You don't have to script every word, of course, you know, you don't, it doesn't need to be a word for word script. You can just script super technical sections, leaving the rest to an outline or kind of ad libbing like I often do, or you can just outline the whole video with the high level points that make sure that, you know, you, you don't miss the certain things that you need to talk about. Be flexible, experiment, and see what comes more naturally to you after after a few tries. You, you, you got to really give it a try before you can judge. If you have an Elgato Stream Deck, the Plus, the XL, any of it, the iPad version, you can switch modes on the prompter super easily, meaning that if you usually monitor yourself, you can still peek a chat. Or if you want to script a specific segment of a stream or ad read, you can pull that up too. I don't like how it's set up at the moment because you can only switch between like two different modes. I, I feel like it should just be a toggle that cycles through them all or a, a single button that just lets you switch scenes basically like an OBS, but you can do that. I have a whole video playlist diving into why you might want to script part of your streams linked below. You have to install the Camera Hub plugin for the Stream Deck, and then you get lots of options for controlling brightness, font size, margins, pausing and progressing the script, switching display mo modes, and so on. Like I said, I have a little complaint about it, but it's pretty sweet. I'm not gonna hide the fact that I am stoked with Elgato's entry into the teleprompter market. I've spent years trying different solutions for this, from using old clunky teleprompter rigs from older times that I had to build myself, to janky box ones that I use for my streams for a bit, to the, the new Padcaster prompters and a couple others along the way. We, we've covered them on the channel over the years. The big ones were hard to rig up, needed fairly constant maintenance, and were a nightmare if you only had one camera and needed to pull it out regularly. Plus, none of the big ones work well at a desk. At one point, I had like three different friction arms holding one teleprompter up, and it just wasn't sustainable. The latest Padcaster Parrot Pro and its patent-violating competition from DeskView are great for portability, just clamping onto the front of the lens, but limit how wide of an angle you can use with them, along with some other use cases. I still use my Padcaster Parrot Pro for my traditional stand-up on-camera videos, like this one. I'm using it right now, but it doesn't make sense to use at the desk for me due to the vignetting of it showing up in wider lenses frames. Plus, all of these have a big limitation. You need something else to actually display your content. For my old big rig, I was using my ancient Microsoft Surface RT tablet with PowerPoints inverted and a clicker. My wife, my wife helped me out with translating my scripts to PowerPoints and then inverting them to show up properly on the, you know, reflected glass, but the overall workflow sucked. With the new ones, I typically use my phone. I'm using my phone right now with the Parrot app, but there's still, you know, a ton of friction because I have to copy my scripts over from whatever I wrote them in to Google Docs and then from Google Docs to the Parrot app. You, you, you can set all these up with like a little five inch field monitor running to your PC, although those are more likely to show up in your frame. I used to do that for chat on my old retro setup, but their size and the resolution often do not work well for script reading. All that to say, Elgato making something that is an all encompassing solution with the built in screen and that just requires a USB cable and it's dropped down low enough to stay out of frame. It's fantastic. While it's an expensive solution, you can just buy the cheaper stuff if if that's what you want in the first place, professional iterations of this kind of teleprompter frequently cost upwards of like $700. That's too much. $289, doable for people doing this full time. Unfortunately, the screen is only USB-C, so there's no HDMI inputs. If you wanted to run something specific into it or extend its life outside of this use case, you have to route it through your PC or Mac first. You don't need a USB-C port on your computer, you just need a standard USB 3 port. I do. It comes with a USB-C to A cable in the box, so pretty slick. Basically anyone can use this. It mounts with multiple different quarter 20 thread mount points on, you got one on the back here, you've got two on the bottom, uh, which is pretty sick. So you can use any tripod camera mount or Elgato's multi-mount system to attach to it. That 
ecosystem just continues to grow and provide more value. To mount your camera, you can either screw, uh, I didn't have it prepared ahead of time, the L bracket into the back of this, which screws in like so, uh, and then mount your camera to the L bracket, for which is great for webcams or really, really small cameras. They include a backplate for the Facecam Pro specifically in the box that blocks out any additional light. Uh, and then other cameras can just use the shroud, this little black cloth that just kind of goes over the back of your camera to keep any light from getting in. You want this because any light leaks coming from the back, uh, you know, behind the camera will reflect on and glare up the glass, which will mess up your footage. It'll wash it out. You'll see little reflections in it, whatever. Elgato sells a separate phone mount if you want to slot your phone in here. While useful, and I'm glad they support it, I don't know that that would make sense as a primary use case because this is kind of designed to be your setup and forget rig. For most big mirrorless and DSLR style cameras, you'll want to use the lens mounting system. For this, you attach one of the included ring mounts to the front of your lens, like a normal lens filter, and then attach the correct plate to the prompter. So I have the lens mount plate on here right now, and then you just slide it on the front of the lens. This free mounts the teleprompter to your camera. But it's not, it's honestly not heavy at all, giving, given what all you have here. So it's not heavy enough to be a concern for like breaking your camera or anything like that. They include all the necessary filter thread adapters in the box. And if you have something smaller than that, you can buy super cheap step up rings. This is very similar to how the Padcaster and DeskView teleprompters mount. The fact that Elgato includes all of these different mounting options from physically mounting the thing to the camera mounting plate to the L bracket to everything, all of that's included in the box, which is absolutely rad. It even fits in the Elgato ring light, mostly without issue. It blocks a little bit of the light, but it, I think it ends up working pretty well. Elgato even hosts their own database of webcams and cameras that they've tested compatibility with so far, which is pretty neat. Okay, so you all know my big problem with these. We've covered this before, but you know my big problem with these is supporting the wider angle lenses that I like using. And wow, my Canon R6 and 2470 lens is too much for the standard L bracket, which is unfortunate because you could theoretically, you know, push wider lenses up closer to the glass. Uh, I have to use the lens mounting system, but I have no problem fitting my 24 millimeter that's full frame, wide open, and seeing not a single ounce of the prompter in the frame. And that is freaking awesome. I have no easy way of mounting it because it doesn't have lens threads, but my big 16 millimeter super wide angle lens seems to work fine too. My 14 millimeter starts to see it. That is a very wide angle lens, but this makes it the best wide angle friendly prompter that you can get right now. And part of that is due to the, the angles that they chose to keep the glass in the front wide so that it doesn't show up in the frame, but also how far down they dropped the screen. So basically it's just higher up here compared to other prompters and then lower down here instead of kind of crowding the lens. It makes a huge difference. I don't know why anyone else hasn't done this. Like this, this is exactly what we needed. The screen is big, it's bright, I think it's like an eight or nine inch screen. It's impressively clear for chat, scripts, or desktop use. It runs at a low resolution by default, but that's all you really need for it. Everything looks clear and sharp. Just make sure you're using dark mode with black backgrounds to avoid glare, of course. Anything bright white is gonna glare regardless of what this is made of. Uh, I recommend setting your wallpaper to black for this monitor too, and just set everything to run in dark mode if that's what you're using. There's two hot shoe mounts on the top, which let you mount little microphones, lights, whatever else you wish up there, just so that you're not losing the hot shoe on your camera, which is pretty sweet. The ironic part of all this talk on how you can improve your presence and content with the teleprompter is that when you actually first set it up, it can actually make you act more awkward as you get used to it. It depends on what path you take. And so I, I really worry that everyone that rushed out to buy it is gonna have a really poor first impression because they really gotta get used to it. These tips compound on each other. So don't just take one and roll with it. Watch through all this and I promise you'll get through it. You'll, you'll, you'll come out the other side with a much better presentation. All right, the two paths. With the monitoring and video chatting angle, you should just immediately feel more natural and it'll help you warm up to filming and streaming. Easy, like I see no reason that that would make it worse unless you're just not used to looking at something at all. But when you're scripting, not used to reading scripts or reading chat on the fly while you talk, yeah, it's gonna be rough. At first. It's gonna be pretty rough at first. There's a bit of a learning curve. But here's some tips. First, guide your reading with an outline. If you scripted, if you only scripted your video, go back and jot down an outline of your sections and high-level talking points or parts you really want to emphasize or make sure you get perfectly right. Better yet, do this in a separate format, like on paper instead of typing, which will help you reinforce what you wrote like when you're studying in school. It'll help you point out any last minute flaws and help you remember better. This outline can help guide your script reading so that you know what to expect as you go. You get a little preview going. Second, I'd recommend memorizing parts of your script. Not, not the whole thing, but not, you know, not having to read every single word verbatim 
does wonders to influ see i just messed up it does wonders to improving the fluency and natural speaking tone you carry i'm specifically leaving some extra errors in this video so that you can kind of pick up what i'm talking about you don't want to sound like that freshman in high school struggling to read aloud from a textbook no no one wants that in a video or stream you want to sound like you often whenever i'm in between sections or i'm really struggling with a section i will pause the prompter and just reread that same bit of text the, the you know the next few lines over and over to try to memorize it a little bit and go through it a few times so that i can say it from memory and then start to you know smoothly transition from what i'm saying from memory to the rest as i'm reading ahead because once i'm re you know saying it from memory i can start reading the next lines reading ahead is a critical part of teleprompter reading you don't really read word for word one at a time as they come up you say what you've already read as you're reading the next part you see what i mean you, you, you're reading the next sentence and saying it as if you're talking this can be really tricky at first but it is crucial for sounding like a human being and talking like you would normally talk if you're talking to someone else it takes a fair bit of practice that's also why i recommend reading through your script a few times and trying to memorize bits of it here or there to help you along the way any part you recognize and can sail through will make the rest of it that you actually have to read and you know pay attention to the script that much easier a big part of sounding like yourself is to make sure you're writing in your own voice this is something that they try teaching in school but honestly don't do a great job actually explaining it's all about using the phrases the speaking quirks and pacing that you normally talk to another person with instead of a completely academically correct writing keep it conversational as if you're explaining it to someone else without being too formal or messy to practice this you might actually try explaining the thing to someone else that your video or stream is about and writing down how you say it. Or you might try to use speech to text dictation to write down your initial wording so that you basically pretend you're talking to someone. If you find yourself stumbling over sentences or words, if you find yourself stumbling or if you find yourself stumbling over sentences or words a lot when reading your script, it's possible you're writing too generically or trying to sound smarter than you usually talk. This is quite common online. Most people either write way more formally and more detached than they speak or way too informally with no structure or punctuation. Trying to read that out loud is really tough. Writing how you speak is a muscle that you will have to work at, but you will get better every single time you do it. When it comes to presenting, do not just stare straight at the lens nonstop for the duration of your shoot or stream. Don't, don't, don't do this. It's off-putting at best. And again, it's not very natural looking. You don't do this in a conversation. You don't want to creep your chat out. You don't want to creep whoever you're on a video call without. You just want to look like you're paying attention to them, that you're talking to them. Next time you're having a face-to-face -face conversation with a real person, should you do that again in your life, Pay attention. Take note of the different ways that you, you know, you, you change your focus. You look at different things. You maybe look at different parts of the person as you're recalling information. You may look up to try to think or remember a detail. You look away to process. You might get distracted for a moment. Observe body language and those kinds of things. Try to recall these, you know, natural patterns whenever you're actually recording or streaming. And remember to act as if you're talking to a real person because more or less you are. They're just on a delay through some servers. It helps a lot. This is also why solutions like the NVIDIA broadcast eye contact feature is really cool from a technical standpoint, but the current iteration is still way too uncanny to be useful here for a lot of people. Don't be afraid to use your hands too. Some people get really annoyed by way too much hand usage, but you don't want to be a plank that just like sits in one place and doesn't budge because that will also affect your presentation. You want to be loose. You want to be free. You don't, don't want to be rigid and not able to emote or, or be yourself. Also, just as a note, when reading scripts, keeping the prompter as far away from you as possible with a bit more of a zoomed in lens uh, helps avoid the, cons the, the obvious eye darting side to side as you read. Alternatively, you can also just adjust margins in the prompter app to keep things centered, but then they have to move faster to, for you to keep up with. You got options. Ultimately, you can't get around the fact that practice is absolutely necessary. No one sits down in front of a teleprompter the first time and excels at it. Keeping up with a flowing script, learning to read ahead, etc. takes <sighs> takes a lot of practice. It takes a lot of getting used to. It probably took me a good couple years whenever I was first starting. Now, granted, I was doing the PowerPoint way I mentioned that was really rough and whatever, but it did take me quite a while. It's a lot to keep up with at once. But when you do get the hang of it, it feels pretty instinctual. You'll want to allocate you know, extra time to your first couple videos to make room for stumbles, redos, and whatever as you go. Perhaps write some test scripts and just practice reading from it without actually shooting a video at all. That way you can get that experience without the stakes of whatever video you were trying to make on the line. You could also make it part of your stream to practice while live. Your viewers will get a kick out of it. 
I would also say consider reading children's books or commercial scripts to imitate the emotion of someone in those shoes. Oh, hi, it's me, Josh. Blue and I are having a love day party and you're invited. As someone who never took voice cl voice acting classes and seriously regrets it and it's still, you know, on my list, I struggle to present in any sort of emotive way consistently. I'm not the magnetic, cheery, smiley host that most people flock to in terms of charisma or whatever, but I practice when reading to my kid and I will keep working on it and eventually I'll get around to taking classes. Speaking of which, I say this all the time, but a big thing you can make sure you can do to make sure you really excel and get ahead of the rest when streaming or making videos to get success in this online journey is to get more experience and training in this kind of work. So again, vocal coaching, voice acting coaching, public speaking, interpersonal communication classes, get improv troops, stand-up comedy experience. I took a both a public speaking and an interpersonal comm course in college. And they had a massive impact on my capacity to host kind of on-camera videos and transition from super mumbly mic-only gaming videos to full productions with confidence. Um, I spent quite a few clips up here just for the sake of getting it all in one video because I didn't feel like recording more of this. They were critical in that experience. Community college or free courses exist need to do a little bit of research you want something uh, more in person than online if you can because part of the experience but some of that stuff can absolutely be taught online admittedly my kind of adhd means that i'm just uh, i'm real bad at just doing the thing and forming new habits so like i said vocal coaching has been very high on my list supposedly for years but i haven't got around to it i am hoping 2024 is the year i start really going in on a bunch of different kinds of courses and classes like that but don't be like me or all the other streamers you don't want to be on the same level as them. Don't just assume this is experience you'll get while you're streaming or making videos. You, you don't really. You often will just form those bad habits and stick with them. And anytime someone complains about it, you'll be defensive. You'll be too complain. You, you don't want to listen to the complaints. So those who actually push themselves to further their experience in these areas already are and will continue to be those who stand out and become the top streamers or video creators because they are the ones that are the most entertaining. Most people are boring. Most people don't have that kind of background. So many top streamers and creators have backgrounds in entertainment, comedy, or have taken classes in there. It's worth it. It's also worth considering your technique for speaking in general when hosting videos and how it relates to your on-camera presence. I have a whole video about speaking technique linked below. Initially, this question got a chuckle out of me, but then this other reply just really sent me. I mean, I guess you could game on it. Keep in mind you're playing from a reflection, so sharpness and clarity are not going to be as good as a native monitor, which is why I think it's silly to care about actual resolution at play here. I tried to get a latency measurement. Uh, obviously, things like NVIDIA LDAT or my normal time sleuth method doesn't work on a reflective piece of glass because then it's blocking the signal that's reflecting off of it. My roughest estimate for input latency to the monitor itself is about 3 milliseconds. I have no clue how accurate that is. Like, I can't get a realistic number because there's no HDMI input and the whole setup's a mess. But it's fast enough if you wanted to do that. Again, I worry about eye strain, but hey, there you go. All right, it kept coming up that people want a bigger version of this, and I, for the life of me, cannot figure out why. One of the biggest, unintended, problems with the cheaper and older teleprompters has always been the size. Big ones are always way more of a pain in the ass to work with, and they're not all going to stay held up on desks and stands. And I don't think without seeing a side by side, it's just clear just how much bigger this thing is than compared to the usual, you know, parrot prompters and such. Like, it's already pretty big. It is plenty big. Even if you have eyesight issues, you can make the font bigger. I cannot possibly imagine wanting it bigger, especially with lighting and other things to coordinate here, other than to use as a monitor replacement. Which again, working through a translucent reflection just doesn't seem like a good idea, both for clarity and latency's sake. And for your eyes? I don't know. Y'all weird on this one. <laughs> I do hope we get some way to use this wirelessly via an iPad or something eventually. I know this seems kind of moving backwards towards the goals of this, but and drivers will always be a concern here. And yes, I obviously do have the ones that use my phone. I'm using it now, but hear me out. The big friction with my A-roll setup I have now with the Padcaster and everything else is that I have to copy my script from wherever I wrote it to Google Docs, open it on my phone, copy it to the parrot prompter, and then my phone is tied up. And then if I get any notifications, it's blocking my screen, all of that kind of thing. And I got to crank up the brightness, mute, mute my phone, all of that. And then I got to put my phone in the prompter, which then messes up the angle. And I got to, I got to fix all that and start over. I can't just leave my phone or tablet in there because 
I, I want to be able to use it. And even if I just used a spare phone, remote controlling those kinds of things kind of sucks. So you're still pulling it out to load the script and then putting it back. It, it sucks, okay? If I could have this on my big rolling camera setup I'm using now and just set my iPad on the shelf below that and then just plug this into my iPad whenever I'm, you know, ready to start shooting. But otherwise, like, I could just take my iPad with me. That would be so much easier to manage, copying the script and everything. And I'm usually writing my scripts on my iPad to begin with. I could use a laptop here, but they're bigger and all the ones and need plugged in and all the ones I have make noise. So not an ideal solution. I don't I don't think we'll get this, but I would love some sort of wireless. I, I, I don't know. I realize that it's going backwards. I do think you could, the, the screen is removable. I do think you could build a tablet or phone mount for it. But again, we're, we're very much regressing at that point. Yes. You have other options for teleprompters, cheaper options. But if you've used these before, or you're a career creator in any field, you almost immediately know why this is a valuable addition to the market. This is the unique problem solving that Elgato frequently does with their products. They don't make stuff for newcomers for the most part. They make solutions for people actually working in this field who have problems that need solutions. <laughs> And that's totally fine. I, I don't know why that bothers so many people. Check out those technique videos I mentioned in the description to get the most out of this, aside from everything I included in this big video. If you want to keep mastering your craft, you need to check out and buy my OBS Definitive Guide course at glitch.mov. And remember to be kind, rewind.